Welcome and thank you for coming to the Mad City Vegan Fest. I'm Lynn Pauley, co-director of Alliance for Animals. Alliance for Animals is a sponsor of the Vegan Fest and has been for the past three years. Yay. <laughs> It's my honor to introduce Dr. Michael Greger. Um, having him here is really a feather in our cap for Madison. Madison is really becoming a vegan friendly town. I don't know if you've noticed, we have a new billboard on Stoughton Avenue. It says madisonvegan.com and it lists restaurants that are vegan friendly in Madison. So check it out. Um, Dr. Michael Greger, let me just list a few things. He's lectured at a conference on world affairs. He's testified before Congress. He's appeared on the Dr. Oz show. He's been a guest on the Colbert Report. <laughs> That's the big one. <laughs> Yay, Madison. Um, um, he was also invited as an expert witness on the Oprah Winfrey meat defamation scandal. And the reason why he has appeared and been asked to appear on all these stages is because he has done his homework. Um, Dr. Greger has extensively studied the world's clinical nutrition and he's become an expert on giving information, practical advice, on preventing, treating, and even reversing the top 15 killing, killer diseases. He currently serves as the Director of Public Health and Animal Agriculture at the Humane Society of the United States. His credentials are all in your program. It would take me a long time to go through those. And you probably want to hear him, not me. Join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Greger. For those unfamiliar with my work, every year I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world, so you don't have to. <laughs> Every year my talks are brand new because every year the science is brand new. I then compile all the most interesting, most groundbreaking, the most practical results into new videos and articles I upload every day to my website, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There's no ads, no corporate sponsorships, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything. Just put it up as a public service. For those of you who've seen my talks in past years, you know that I've addressed some of the most pressing dietary issues of our time, like what's the healthiest variety of apple, for example, or what's the most nutritious nut, or the, the best bean, the best berry, the best bowel movement. This is from last year. Who's number one and number two? Well, it certainly wasn't New Yorkers, if you remember that. The most constipated population ever studied, actually, in the medical literature, outputting a mere three ounces a day. Maybe if they just eat a big apple once in a while. <clears throat> but I thought this year I'd lighten it up and ask, what's the best way to prevent death? Every year, the CDC lists the top 15 causes of death. I said, well, look, let's just go through the list, one through 15, and explore the role diet may play in preventing, arresting, and even reversing our top 15 killers. Number one on the list, heart disease. The 35-year-old follow-up of the Harvard Nurses Health Study was just released, uh, following over 100,000 women for decades, now considered kind of the most definitive study on older women's health. And in that time, it was such a big study over so long, thousands of participants have died, but that allows us to look at the risk factors for mortality. The number one cause of death for these women and women around the country um, was heart disease, so no surprise, dietary cholesterol is a significant risk factor for dying. Killer number two for these women was smoking-related cancer deaths. What's so nice about this study is what's called a competing risks analysis, which allows us to compare different risks to one another. So, for example, 
Eating the amount of cholesterol found in a single egg every day appears to shorten a woman's life as much as smoking five cigarettes a day every day for 15 years. And this was supported recently by the study by a Canadian team of researchers who found a similar exponential increase in risk for both pack years of smoking as well as egg consumption. So right here, this is 40 years smoking a pack a day, similar kind of exponential rise for the amount of eggs people eat in a week. The most protective dietary factor they found was fiber consumption. Eating just a single cup of oatmeal's worth of fiber every day appears to extend a woman's life as much as jogging four hours a week. No reason you can't do both. <clears throat> but I think it's important to take a step back and say, well, wait a second, the one dietary component associated with living the shortest life, cholesterol, only found in one place, and that's animal foods. And the one dietary factor found associated with the longest lifespan, fiber, only found in one place, and that's whole plant foods. The single plant food, um, not just component, but food itself associated with the longest lifespan was actually nut consumption. Eating just two handfuls of nuts a week appears to get you that same four hours of weekly jogging benefit. You say, yeah, yeah heart disease, number one cause of death, but what if my cholesterol's normal? I get that all the time from first time patients. I have to break it to them that, you look, having a normal cholesterol in a society where it's normal to drop dead of a heart attack, a number one killer, not necessarily a good thing. Um, from this uh, massive uh, study uh, recently, looking at tens of thousands of people, this is those that had heart attacks, found that, um, uh, that um, the uh, close to half had so-called bad cholesterol levels classified in the guidelines as optimal. Let me just go back um, one to show that most actually had um, normal cholesterol levels. Um, uh, so most, uh, so uh, almost three quarters fell within the recommended targets of so-called bad cholesterol, demonstrating the current guidelines just not strict enough, close to half classified as optimal. Though I'm not sure their grieving spouses and orphan children will take much comfort in that fact. Having an optimal cholesterol in this society is still way too high. Right. Sure, having a below average cholesterol can lower your risk, but we don't want low risk, we want no risk. As the editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Cardiology wrote more than a decade ago, maybe it's time to start shifting from just decreasing risk to getting rid of this epidemic um, uh, overall. How do you do it? Well. Um, he wrote that uh, for the progression of atherosclerotic plaque, heart disease to cease, it appears that our total cholesterol, everyone should know, know their total cholesterol, needs to be lowered to the 150 area. Right? In other words, we all have to have a total cholesterol lowered to that of your average pure vegetarian or vegan. Uh, he goes on to say, because relatively few people are willing to eat like that, let's put everybody on drugs, put a, drugs in the water supply, et cetera, et cetera. But um, bottom line, look, it's our choice diet or drugs. Why not choose the drugs? All right, legitimate question. Well, uh, last year FDA released new safety uh, labeling warnings um, regarding uh, uh, side effects for these uh, statin class of drugs, like Lipitor, and Crestor, Vitorin, Mevacor, excuse, um, et cetera. New brain-related side effects regarding memory loss and confusion, as well as increasing blood sugar levels and new onset diabetes. So as kind of as one leading cardiologist described this Faustian bargain, yeah, sure, heart, fewer heart attacks on these drugs, but more cases of diabetes. Um, the latest uh, um, group of side effects um, that we're concerned about uh, recently described is the adverse effects of these statin drugs on energy and fatigue, particularly for women even at modest doses. Well, the memory loss and fatigue associated with these drugs, I may have forgotten, you know, there's actually a way to decrease one's risk of heart disease and diabetes at the same time with a healthy plant-based diet. Now cholesterol is just half of the heart disease story, the other half is inflammation. We've known for 15 years now that a single meal high in animal fat, um, they used sausage and egg McMuffins, the original study, 
um, and have since repeated it with all sorts of animal foods over the last 15 years, appears, single meal appears to um, paralyze our arteries, cutting their ability to relax in, normally in half within just hours after consumption. Um, our entire vascular tree gets inflamed and stiffened, and just as this inflammatory crippled state starts calming down five, six hours later, lunchtime! <laughs> right, we may whack our arteries with another load of meat, eggs, or dairy, such that many Americans are stuck in this chronic state of kind of low-grade inflammation, potentially increasing their risk for inflammatory diseases like heart disease, diabetes, certain forms of cancer, one meal at a time. Um, and unfortunately, I only have uh, 45 minutes here, so I don't have time to talk about um, the mechanism behind it, but it's been a really fascinating detective story. I encourage you to, um, uh, to, to check out the website and see how they came in. Actually, not the animal fat, not the animal protein either. Turns out it's these uh, bacterial toxins called endotoxins. Uh, the animal products are so packed with bacteria that can cause inflammation, dead or alive, even when they're fully cooked. Um, and the saturated fat actually does boost the absorption of these bacterial toxins into our bloodstream. And that's why we get this kind of boost of inflammation after each meal. But I will leave that to the site and go to cancer next, killer number two. According to the largest perspective, meaning forward-looking study ever done on diet and cancer, the uh, incidence of all cancers combined lower among those eating meat-free diets compared to those eat, um, having meat in their diet. And particularly striking was the, um, the, the low rates of uh, lymphomas leukemias, so the, some of the fastest growing tumors, so-called kind of liquid cancers. And out of all the animal products they looked at, poultry consumption, very surprising for them, um, was most associated with risk. So we're seeing, uh, so there's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, various lymphomas and leukemias, about a tripling of risk for every 50 grams of daily po um, poultry consumption. That's just like a quarter of a chicken breast a day may triple our risk of these cancers. In fact, the link between uh, cancer and meat is such that even the journal Meat Science published an article recently asking, should we become vegetarians or can we make meat safer? And that's what they're talking about. So a number of additives they're trying to come up with to suppress the toxic effects of, for example, the heme iron, the blood-based iron in meat. The additives are still kind of under study, but could provide what they call an acceptable way to prevent cancer, because obviously lowering meat consumption completely out of the question. <laughs> they're concerned that should the National Cancer Institute recommendations to decrease meat consumption, should they be adhered to, sure, cancer incidents may be reduced, but farmers in the meat industry would suffer important economical problems. Now for those more concerned about the suffering caused by the meat industry rather than the suffering of the meat industry, <laughs> what happens when you put cancer on a vegan diet? Um, the Pritikin Research Foundation published this elegant series of experiments, which I want to spend a few moments on. Simple experiments. You take people, you put them on different diets, you draw their blood, and then you just drip their blood on uh, cancer, human cancer cells growing in a petri dish, and you just see whose blood is better at suppressing cancer growth. So they were the ones that worked with Dr. Dean Ornish. Um, that found that, for example, the blood circulating within the bodies of vegans was dramatically less hospitable to cancer. The blood of those eating the standard American diet suppresses cancer growth. If it didn't, uh, most of us wouldn't be here right now. It's just that the blood circulating within vegans um, suppresses cancer growth about eight times better. So the standard American diet group can suppress cancer growth by 9%, but put people on a plant-based diet for a year um, and their blood just kind of tears it up. Now this was men um, with uh, prostate cancer. Uh, they wanted with the, kind of the number one uh, male cancer. Uh, but for women, it's breast cancer, number one cancer killer of young women. So they wanted to repeat the study using women and breast cancer cells. But look, they didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. Women are dying now. So they said, let's see what a plant-based diet can do after just two weeks eating healthy against three different lines of uh, human breast cancer cells. Uh, so this is the before uh, cancer cell growth powering away at 100%, and then this is after two weeks of a 
plant-based diet. This is kind of a representative uh, petri dish before you lay down a carpet of breast, human breast cancer. You drip the blood of those eating, uh, women eating the standard American diet. And as you can see, uh, even women eating kind of crappy diets, they can have the ability to break down some cancer. But then you take these exact same women, put them on a healthy plant-based diet for two weeks, so they act as their own control, same women, and their blood can do this, right? Um, the same blood now circulating through these women's bodies significantly gained the power to slow down and stop um, breast cancer growth. Now, slowing down cancer growth is nice. Getting rid of it is even better. This is what's called tunnel imaging, uh, measuring DNA fragmentation, cell death. So when cells die, they release light. So as, again, um, uh, yeah, even women needing the standard American diet can kill off a few breast cancer cells. Take these same women, plant-based diet for two weeks, and their blood can do this. Right? Kind of raises the question, you know, what kind of blood do we want in our body? What kind of immune system? Do we want blood that just kind of rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop it? Um, oh, there's so much more interesting stuff on that topic, the mechanism. Um, uh, which again we just discovered and I saw uh, um, the, bo the bottom line is actually the animal protein increasing the levels of this cancer promoting growth hormone called IGF-1 whole series of videos on the site I encourage you to check it out but um, let me move on to killer number three used to be heart disease cancer stroke right oh that's so 2012 <laughs> now it's a heart disease cancer and COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, like emphysema. Uh, thankfully, a, a plant-based diet can actually reduce the risk of getting COPD, can actually even be used to treat uh, COPD. Uh, again, don't have time to go into it. Very exciting study. Actually able to improve lung function by just adding a few fruits and vegetables to people's um, daily diets. Um, and that's something that's supposed to happen in emphysema. It's supposed to get worse, 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 and then you die. But here, improve lung function, the magic bullet, just adding some fruits and vegetables, whether it's the antioxidant effect, the anti-inflammatory effect, very exciting, certainly from a clinical standpoint. But, you know, the tobacco industry viewed these landmark findings a little differently. If adding plants to one's diet can improve lung function, wouldn't it be easier to just add them to cigarettes? <laughs> and indeed! The addition of acai berries to cigarettes evidently has a protective effect against emphysema in smoking mice. <laughs> Who would have thunk it, right? Next, they're gonna start adding you know, berries to meat. And indeed, I couldn't make this stuff up. The uh, adding fruit extracts to burger patties was not without its glitches. Uh, the blackberries uh, dyed the burger patties with this distinct purplish color, which kind of turned people off. So evidently you can improve the uh, tenderness of lamb carcasses if you infuse them before rigor mortis sets in with kiwi fruit juice. You can even improve the nutritional profile of frankfurters by adding powdered grape seeds. Um, though there were complaints that some of the grape seed particles were visible in the final product. And if there's one thing we know about hot dog eaters, it's that they're picky about what goes in their food. <laughs> oh, pig anus? Oh, but grape seeds? Ew! <laughs> Next on the list is stroke. Killer number four, preventing strokes is all about eating potassium-rich foods. Potassium. From the words pot ash, take any plant, put it in a pot, reduce the ash, add water, skim away the ash, boil it down, left with a white residue called pot ash yum, potassium. That's how they got the name. I just described that because that's where potassium is found in plant foods. But who can tell me a plant particularly high in potassium? Um, well, bananas is kind of the tip. I don't know if, uh, if uh, Chiquita had a good PR firm or something. That's like the one thing everybody, no matter where I go, everybody knows. Um, uh, in fact, even joke, you could walk into the heart attack grill in Vegas where they're eating stuff like this. In fact, their second uh, spokesperson just died of a heart attack after the first one died of a heart attack. Um, and you could ask anyone, they'd be like, I don't know what to eat, but I know bananas got potassium. Everybody knows that. Turns out uh, bananas don't even 
come into the 50, top 50 sources of potassium, coming in at number 86, right behind fast food vanilla milkshakes. It goes fast, and then bananas. The most concentrated source of potassium in the diet, well, first is the tomato and orange concentrates. That's not really fair. In terms of uh, whole foods, greens, beans, and dates. In fact, and bananas down 86. In fact, if you look at the next leading cause of death, bananas could be downright dangerous. <laughs> Alzheimer's disease, now our sixth leading killer. Two years ago, Alzheimer's was the eighth leading killer in the United States. Last year was the seventh leading killer in the United States. Now it's the sixth leading killer. Four million Americans suffering. Now we have known for decades now um, that uh, people who eat meat, red meat or white meat, doesn't matter, appear to be between two to three times the risk of becoming demented. And the longer you go eating meat-free, the lower your risk appears to drop. But again, this has been known for decades. Some of the exciting new research is actually on treating Alzheimer's with natural plant-based remedies like the spice saffron, which beat out placebo and actually appear to work as well as the leading uh, drug prescribed. Um, and so certainly I encourage people to check that out if you know anyone suffering from that horrible condition. Diabetes is killer number seven. Thankfully, a plant-based diet can Prevent diabetes can even be used to treat and reverse diabetes in many cases if caught early enough. Um, this is uh, from the Adventist 2 study. This is the largest study of uh, people eating plant-based diets in North America. So compared to uh, um, those that eat meat, those that cut out all meat except fish may or may not have uh, slightly lower levels of uh, diabetes. Cut out all meat uh, risk for, um, does indeed fall. Um, and cut out meat, um, eggs and dairy as well and appears to fall even further. And this is critically after controlling for weight, right? You say, well, yeah, of course vegans have less diabetes, they're so skinny on average. But no, no, this is even, so even at the same weight, um, those eating plant-based diets have just a fraction of the diabetes risk. Um, but that does raise a question, you know, kind of why um, are vegans on average so slender? So. Um, so the current, uh, the average, um, uh, um, average BMI, body mass index, um, of the average American is almost obese actually now at 28.8. Um, those that eat meat more on kind of a weekly basis um, uh, do a little better. Even the average vegetarian in this country is overweight. Um, the only dietary group that's on average, they used to call this normal weight, it's not normal anymore, so now they just call it ideal weight. Um, but the only group that hits that are those eating kind of strictly plant-based diets. And the question is why? It's over years, you've seen my talks, you see I talked about some of the theories. And they do eat fewer calories, but not that many fewer calories. That's about a 36 pound difference between the average meat eater um, and uh, the average vegan. And that's what you see in these kind of intervention studies um, where you uh, change their diets. You see about a 36 pound uh, weight loss on average. So it can't really um, be explained by this in that time frame. So I've talked about some of the theories. Maybe it's because um, vegetarians have increased gene expression of this kind of fat shoveling enzyme in the power plants or mitochondria in our cells called carnitine palmitoyl transferase. It's upregulated by about 40%. So vegetarians just kind of burn more, kind of oxidize more fat just while they're sleeping. Um, uh, maybe because they actually harbor different kind of gut bacteria which handle energy differently, maybe because of these so-called obesogenic chemicals that may build up in the meat supply. There's even obesity-causing virus in poultry that may be playing a role, but here's the latest. Maybe it's, oh, I didn't get to talk about propionate. I'm sorry, I had to cut that out. But here's the latest data. What I showed you before was a cross-section study. That 36-pound difference between the average vegan and average meat eater, that's a snapshot in time. It's called cross-sectional data. You can't prove cause and effect. Maybe people who are you know, slender start eating healthy, not the other way around. So what we need is a perspective study, a study that follows people over time. There's no study that's ever been done bigger than this one. So following hundreds of thousands of people for years, um, why they wanted to know um, the association between the consumption of meat and weight gain. What did they find? They found that meat consumption was associated with weight gain um, and so therefore suggested decrease in meat consumption to improve weight management and this was after controlling for smoking and how much they exercise. But here's the kicker. This is after controlling for calories. 
So even you have two people eating the exact same number of calories, the person eating more meat may gain more weight. They even calculated how much more. So for example, if you ate a steak every day, you'd lead to an annual weight gain 422 grams higher than the weight gain experienced if you had the exact same number of calories but just ate less meat. And after a couple of years, you could put on a, pounds, a few pounds like this, and steak was nothing. Poultry consumption actually the, had the strongest relationship with weight gain. So for example, uh, you eat a quarter pounder every day. This is the amount of weight gain they calculate you'd add um, every year in addition to the weight gain just from the calories in that burger. If instead you ate processed meat every day like a ham sandwich, even though the ham sandwich had the exact same number of calories as the burger, um, it appears to be worse in terms of obesity, abdominal obesity. Um, but this is where poultry came in, so this is about a half a chicken breast a day. And again, this is above and beyond the uh, calories actually found in that chicken. So they, uh, in conclusion, um, uh, not surprising, meat intake associated with weight gain persisting after adjusting for calories, therefore, of course, in favor of the public health recommendation to decrease meat consumption for health improvement. Um, animal products also tend to be, uh, oh, well, what did the National Cattlemen's Beef Association have to say about that study? It's a funny story. I don't have time to get into it, but please check it out um, if you're interested. And the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine did this really interesting workplace intervention at GEICO, actually, GEICO Corporate Headquarters, um, to find out what you can do in a work setting um, to improve people's health if you're interested in that as well. <laughs>